Good morning. My name is Jessica Westland. Please open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 9. We'll be reading verses 6 through 11. If you're using the Blue Bibles, it is page number 1761. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Thanks, Jessica. Well, good morning, church. So good to be together on this Thanksgiving weekend. Good morning to you who are in the Connection Cafe or who are watching our live stream. It is good to have you with us. Isn't it fun being generous? This year, my uh, daughter Lydia and I packed a shoebox together for Operation Christmas Child. How many of you maybe did a shoebox this year? I know I, I don't do one every year. This year I happened to do one. We thought it would be fun. Uh, so we went to the toy aisle, I guess, and um, I can barely tell you how much fun we were having. Uh, we didn't get kicked out, uh, but I suppose we could have. We were having a great time. Uh, we had decided that we were going to package a shoebox for a boy age 5 to 9. And so we're trying to think, okay, okay, what would a boy age 5 to 9 Somewhere in the world, could be kind of any language, any culture, what, what would he enjoy? And so, of course, we went straight for the dinosaurs. And, you know, you got to try out the dinosaurs. You're like, kind of like, how would you fight with them? And we're like, well, we don't want to get one that's too violent. You know, we don't want a whole lot of blood or anything. But we don't want a wimpy dinosaur either, you know. Like, let's get a real, like, dinosaur here. Then we moved on to the trucks and the cars and deciding which truck, which car to get. And we're like, man, well... You know, every, every boy needs a pickup truck, but then you need some kind of a Jeep or an off-road vehicle too. And, and then it'd be kind of cool to have like a fire truck and maybe a tow truck so that if your car gets stuck, you can pull it out. And then we're like, oh yeah, it's all got to fit in a shoebox. So then we go to the smaller ones and we're thinking maybe we can get a set of cars, but then some of them, the wheels didn't turn. And we're like, no, that's, that's wrong. If we're going to get our boy a truck or a car, the wheels are going to turn on that thing. So we're like trying to see if we can sort of open the package just a little and see, you know, like how it works. And then there's all the athletic stuff, and we're like, oh, great, and, you know, football, volleyball, we're grabbing this. So we're like, oh, well, that's right, shoebox. So we're getting like smaller balls that will fit in there, and we had a total blast. And I think we spent uh, $10 to ship it, and we spent more than $10 <laughs> filling it. But it was so fun. It was so just rewarding to think about how we could bless someone and then pray that they would also hear about Jesus in the midst of this whole campaign with Operation Christmas Child. So my question for you this morning is this. When is the last time you had a good time being generous? When you had fun, when you got caught up in the joy of it, and the opportunity to bless somebody. And it just put a smile on your face. And you didn't think so much about how much it cost or exactly all that. It was just thinking of the joy and the blessing you could bring. I believe that's God's heart. And the heart he wants us to find as we follow him and as we grow in our faith. And if you have not experienced the joy of generosity lately you might be doing it wrong. Now, that's not to say there aren't times when being generous takes discipline. That sometimes when we're generous, it can hurt a little. It can even be a little uncomfortable when we discipline ourselves to give where we know there is need. 
But it is to say that more often than not, there should be a generous spirit that wells up within us, that our countenance has changed, our, our tone of voice, the sparkle in our eyes as we think about, what a great opportunity I have here to be generous. So much fun to bless others. We catch a glimpse of this spirit of Christian generosity in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. For God loves a cheerful giver. Now, does this mean that God doesn't love reluctant givers? I'm not sure that that's the point of this verse. And the Lord does love all the Grinches out there, all the Ebenezer Scrooge types out there. The Lord loves all of us. But the Lord wants to change us. He wants to teach us how to have a heart of generosity. God doesn't want our hearts to remain reluctant and stingy. Throughout the Old and New Testament scriptures, we see a pretty clear pattern of God's desire for his people to be a generous people. That's his design. That's his economy of generosity. And not only generous, but joyfully generous. Not just giving out of duty, not just out of obligation. The pattern of Scripture is transformed hearts that become more like God's generous heart. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, even as I think back to the time of packing that shoebox, I just am again just um, remembering how fun that was. But I pray, Lord, in the midst of this time in your word um, that none of this would feel like, that no one would feel like their arm is being twisted, that no one would feel guilt-tripped in any way. But Lord, that just honestly before you, sincerely before you, you, you would help us to evaluate the generosity of our own hearts, to consider your plan for generosity. And Lord, just to be moved by that and moved toward that so that we can be more like you. Help us now in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> well, today we're dropping in on the tail end of chapters 8 and 9 in 2 Corinthians, and there's really a whole bigger narrative going on here that we're not really going to have time to cover. But together, these two chapters give a comprehensive overview of an offering that the Apostle Paul was helping to receive in Corinth so that he could take it to needy people in Jerusalem, believers in Jerusalem who were under some real struggles financially. And there's a whole backstory here. And basically, Paul is helping them complete an offering that they had committed to, but hadn't yet quite received and, and delivered, and he's helping finish that up. Rather than go into all the details of that, though, today we're going to focus on more general principles of Christian generosity. So we want to consider some questions like, what does it mean to be generous? Uh, what does generosity have to do with our Christian faith? How exactly is generosity connected to becoming deeply devoted followers of Jesus together? And those sorts of questions connected to generosity. So let's start with this. As deeply devoted followers of Jesus, being generous is a faithful stewardship of sowing and reaping God's resources. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 begins, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now, apparently, this was a common proverb in the first century. Paul was aware of it. His readers were aware of it. But we don't actually find this proverb in the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Uh, we do find similar proverbs and similar ideas. For example, we could look at Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. It echoes this idea of generosity. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Now, this proverb in verse 6 states a pretty obvious principle of farming. If you only plant a few seeds, you're only going to reap a small harvest because you just haven't planted much. And I can almost imagine the Corinthian farmers who are hearing this letter read on a Sunday morning 
And they're hearing what Paul's saying, and they're saying, yep, mm mm-hmm. I can see them nodding their heads. Yep, that's true. You got to sow generous if you want to reap a good crop. Can't go sparing on the seed. That'd be foolishness. That's how the farmers sounded back then. But Paul takes this obvious farming principle, and then he applies it to Christian generosity. He starts with that, and then gets us to think about how this applies to our generosity. And in verse 6, it lays out this bold and direct call. Be generous. Be generous. It's reminding us that sowing generously results in reaping generously. Now, we need to be a little careful here because Paul's point isn't that we should give more so that we can get more. It sort of sounds that way at first reading, but that would turn Christian generosity into something incredibly self-serving and very unattractive. And to be frank, it's ideas like this that are found in the heretical teaching of prosperity gospel. Give God more. So that God has to give you more, has to bless you more. But that's not what Paul is getting at here. What Paul's actually teaching here is developed more clearly in the verses that follow. So if we jump ahead to verses 10 and 11, he writes, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. So these verses are making it clear that everything we sow and reap is from God. It is for God, for His purposes, and we're called to be faithful stewards of His resources. Ultimately, as followers of Jesus, we don't own anything we own. It all belongs to God. We are the steward of Gondor, if you will for you Tolkien fans. We are stewards of these resources. God's the one who supplies the seed. He's the one who makes the seed grow so that we can all have bread for food. He brings the increase. He enlarges the harvest. These verses also make it clear that we're not just talking about the tangible, physical crops that we're sowing and reaping. There's a spiritual component to all that Paul is saying here, to this generous behavior. Verse 10 ends by noting an enlarged harvest of your righteousness. Now, to be clear, none of us is righteous in and of ourselves. As we've been studying Romans, that has been abundantly clear. Christ imputes His righteousness to us. We we have righteousness because Christ has shared it with us, but we don't have any of our own. So, really what verse 10 is talking about here are the righteous good deeds of God's people. Ephesians 2.10 comes to mind. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, not only does God prepare in advance these good, generous works for us to do, but He also provides for them. He gives the blessing by increasing our store of seed and by enlarging the harvest of our righteous deeds. Now, not all of us can immediately relate to this farming imagery. So even though clearly I myself am not a farmer, uh, let me take a shot here at a layman's explanation of of some of this. God is not talking here about food and money that just falls from the sky. That's not the kind of provision that's happening here. It says he increases the store of seed so that the farmer can go out and work. The store of seed is so the farmer can go out and work by planting even more seeds. And then God enlarges that harvest, not just a harvest of more physical food, but also a spiritual harvest of even more righteous deeds. So there's a beautiful dimension of faith in all this because it calls us to trust God not only for the present but also for the future. He'll provide now, but He'll also provide in the days ahead. You see, this store of seed is referring to the seed that the farmer will need next spring 
When he goes out to plant the crops next spring, he'll need this store of seed ready to go so he can work the field again in the following year. But he doesn't have that crop yet. He's just got the seeds to plant for the crop. God increases our store of seeds. He expects us to trust him to provide a good crop from those seeds in the future, to trust in him for that so we can be generous now and all the more generous in the future as he blesses. But what if next year's crop doesn't go so well? What if we have a tough year, year of drought or whatever it might be? Well, verse 11 speaks to this. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. In other words, God doesn't just expect us to be generous on one occasion, but to re repeatedly be generous on multiple occasions. It's a cycle. His plan is a cycle of ongoing generosity, fueled by ongoing provision from the Lord. That's the promise here. That's the faith here. That's the component of God's economy here. God will keep supplying the seed. He will keep blessing the crop. And then we'll be enriched in every way so that we can keep on being generous on every occasion. He sustains this economy of generosity. I appreciated something I read this week by a Bible scholar named David Garland. He writes, the generous get richer, the miserly grow poorer. But growing richer may not mean wealth the way the world measures wealth. They are spiritually richer and regard whatever material resources they may possess as providing enough for themselves and enough to give to others. The problem with being tight-fisted is that the closed fist prevents us from receiving anything more from God. When we are open-handed with others, our hands are also open to receive more from God. Just appreciated that word picture. Secondly, as deeply devoted followers of Jesus, being generous is also a heart-driven decision accompanied by a cheerful attitude. Verse 7 says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This kind of generosity extends beyond a simple mathematical equation of a 10% tithe. As Paul is writing here, he's talking about a special offering. That's the immediate context of this. And we see this kind of heart-driven decision-making in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So if we jump to Exodus 25.2, for example, one of many, here the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. And we see that idea laid out throughout Scripture. Now, for some of us, verse 7's instruction here about deciding in our hearts what to give might make it sound like Christian generosity is this really overly emotional thing. Like it's this heart thing and feely, touchy-feely thing. In fact, it could even come across as something done during an emotionally impulsive moment or done on a whim rather than as a deliberate prayerful decision of our hearts. Deciding in our heart is talking about a decision that comes from an inward resolve, not just a raw emotion. Paul isn't prompting giving that's fueled by an emotional response any more than he's promoting giving that is devoid of any emotion at all. It's neither one of those extremes. A cheerful giver isn't reluctant to give nor do they need someone to guilt trip them because they've already decided in their hearts through prayerful consideration and time with the Lord what the Lord would have them give. 
It's been a matter of prayer, of searching their heart, of honoring God with their giving. And this is the kind of giving that's accompanied by great joy. When we practice Christian generosity God's way, we shouldn't feel any inkling of regret. Oh, I shouldn't have given that gift. We never feel that. There's no buyer's regret as we join the Lord in all that's happening here with cheerful giving. We give willingly. We give gladly. Our conscience is clear when we lay our pillow on the bed at night. We lay our head on the pillow on the bed at night. There's a joy in it and a beauty and an innocence of it that is just to God's glory. If you read through 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, and I'd encourage you to maybe do that this week, to read both those chapters. It's a wonderful passage. But if you read through it carefully, you'll notice that there's never a point where Paul tells the Corinthian believers how much to give. He doesn't give a dollar amount. He doesn't give a percentage. He urges them to search their hearts. He prods them to prayerfully consider God's call to generosity. He does put a special emphasis on a cheerful attitude, and that should accompany these generous gifts, these decisions to be generous. Again, I want to quote something by Bible scholar David Garland. He says it well. In the Old Testament, giving reluctantly or under compulsion is portrayed as canceling out any benefit that could be received from the gift. While giving with a glad heart promises reward from God. And then he quotes a verse here in reference to helping their fellow Israelites in need, Deuteronomy 15.10. It says, Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. Scripture assumes that what is critical, it teaches what is important here, is the attitude of the one who gives, not the amount. God, who knows and appraises our hearts, values when we give generously. You see, Christian generosity isn't focused on giving a generous amount, but rather on a generous heart, giving from a generous heart. It's about an attitude. An attitude that should mimic the generous heart of our Heavenly Father. And as His children, we want to be more like our Heavenly Father. Thirdly, as deeply devoted followers of Jesus, being generous is also an opportunity to worship God as His righteousness is displayed through us. Verses 8 and 9 say that God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. And verse 11 adds, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Being generous is one of the ways that we can worship and honor the Lord. We make his name famous as we pass along to others the abundance with which He has blessed us, reveals God's goodness. Part of being God's handiwork and being about His business and being one of His business partners is that we've been entrusted with His resources, resources beyond what we need for ourselves, enough resources that we can pass them along to others who are in need. The fact is that each act of generosity demonstrates our trust in God, that He is worthy and He is good and He is faithful. It shows that we believe He'll provide us with whatever we need in order to bless others. I appreciate how my study Bible picks up on this phrase in verse 8. Excuse me. <clears throat> this phrase, having all you need. It notes that as regularly as generous giving depletes the resources of the cheerful giver, God's grace replenishes what is needed. This gives such a person a complete sufficiency, all that you need that comes from depending on an all-sufficient God. Now, again, we want to be careful here. We don't want to take this to extremes. 
This isn't suggesting that we should be reckless in our generosity and that we should assume that God will mathematically match every dollar we give to charity, it'll show up in my bank account the next morning or something like that. That would be reckless. But as we read Scripture, we don't find a scarcity mentality. We don't see that in Scripture. A shortage of funds, a scarcity of God's provision. The fact is, instead of that perspective scarcity and stinginess, we find a perspective of abundant provision, an abundant God who gives lavishly, blesses in so many ways. In whatever ways God has abundantly blessed us, it's so that we can abound in generous good works for His glory. We're blessed so that we can be a blessing. And in this way, we display God's goodness in a tangible way. Ultimately, all of these opportunities that we are given to be generous result in God being worshipped with thanksgiving as His righteousness is displayed through His people. This week as I was studying these verses and kind of mulling them over in my mind, verses 8 and 9 in particular, I started to think about some of the ramifications for how this is put together And I began to wonder to myself, why doesn't God just bless those in need directly? Why not give them the resources directly? Why go through an intermediary? Why arrange it so that those who are blessed with extra need to share with those in need? It's a good question. causing me to reflect on the dangers of American individualism. We're a very individualistic society here in the West. And there's a lot to be said there, but ultimately God's economy seems to be designed for interdependence rather than independence. The way God has arranged all of this generosity and all of these abundant blessings that are overflowing, He gives us more than we need. And he expects us to only keep a portion of it and to give the rest away. God's economy, so interesting. So with some of these thoughts in mind, let me conclude with four benefits of God's design for generosity. First of all, benefit of God's design is that generosity develops mutual love and interdependence within the church body. It guards us from being individualistic hoarders of resources that we don't share with others, of building bigger barns to keep all of our stuff to ourselves. It guards us from that. And generosity, this teaching, this theology, this economy of God, it also guards us against a prideful isolation where we refuse to accept help from anybody else. This means that we should be willing not only to give to the Benevolence Fund, but we should be willing to receive from the Benevolence Fund when we have need. Need to understand that this is part of God's good design. It's part of His plan for keeping us connected to one another as a community of faith, a community of believers who love one another deeply, and we express that love in our time together with our words and our actions, but also with our giving in helping one another with tangible needs that we have from time to time. Second benefit of God's design is that generosity brings God glory. We've already talked about this some, but verses 12 and 13 go on to say, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of the service by which you have proved yourselves. Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Christian generosity is our opportunity to worship God and His righteousness is displayed through us and it brings Him glory. Third benefit 
of God's design is that generosity is a witness to those outside of our church walls. These principles of Christian generosity should be applied not only to those inside the church, but also to those outside the church. It's part of letting our light shine, that others may see these generous good deeds and be drawn to God and give Him glory. And so that's a piece as well, remembering those outside the church walls, those who do not yet know Christ, that we are generous with them as a testimony of God's goodness and God's provision for them even before they are following him, that God is loving them and blessing them and cares for them and he sees them. Fourth and finally, benefit of God's design is that generosity fashions our hearts to become more like God's heart. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 declares, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become poor rich. If you look at the rest of the context here, it starts talking about how we need to excel in this grace of giving, a giving that is mimicking and matched by this wonderful generosity of Jesus Christ. His giving to us teaches us how to be givers to others. God's incredibly generous heart was revealed in the gospel. When Jesus gave up the riches of heaven for us and came down to this earth, we're right on the verge of Advent season where we'll recall all of that. He did this for our spiritual benefit. Not to make us financially rich, physically rich down here on earth, but to expose us to the riches of heaven, to help us enjoy the true riches of His righteousness, becoming His righteous people in every way, including through generosity becoming more and more like Him. God's generous heart is displayed in our salvation through a gospel of grace. 